I'm coming, I'm coming, I'm coming, I'm here. Oh, I'm not late, am I? Phew, good. I was looking for my thinking cap because we're gonna need it today and especially for our lesson tomorrow. But before we get started, can I tell you a short story? I was on a call, a Zoom call, a video conference with my kids in my class yesterday, and we were talking about teaching in room nine. Do you know what my kids said to me? Somebody in my classroom? Mr. Speed, nobody's gonna be able to see you because the light's gonna be shining off your bald head. <laughs> If you were here on the first day, remember I told you, every day in my classroom, ball jokes, old man jokes, and broken hip jokes. And actually, it's good to see that nothing has changed with my kids. So that made me laugh, and I thought I would share that with you this morning. I also want to share with you that I think room nine, quite possibly, is the largest classroom in the region right now, and I think it's due mostly in part to you inviting your friends. So you keep telling your friends about room nine, and we'll keep making room. If today's your first day, my name is Mr. Speed, and I teach fifth grade reading, writing, and social studies at City Academy in St. Louis, Missouri. But in room nine, I teach second, third, and fourth grade reading. And as always, it doesn't matter what grade you're in, as long as you have a desire to learn, there's room for you in my classroom. I also want to share something with you that happened last night. I had an epiphany. Um, can you say epiphany? An epiphany. An aha moment, if you will. Um, we stand here every day and we do our pledge. And... I wanted to talk to you about what lesson I learned last night while I was preparing to talk to you today. So if you just give me a moment, I'll tell you my story, what I learned, and then we'll go on with the lesson. Because remember, on the first day, I said, I hope that I'm going to learn some things, you're going to learn some things, then we would all have some fun. Well, I'm going to share with you what I learned last night. While I was preparing for the lesson, I thought, man... I wonder if there's a way that I could actually draw a picture that might help better illustrate what it is that I want to talk about in today's lesson. Because I know some of you learn better if you're listening, some of you learn better if you're reading, some of you learn if someone's reading with you, some of you learn by looking at pictures. So I was trying to think about how can I get my message across so that I make sure that as many people can understand what it is that I'm trying to teach in this classroom. So I thought a picture for this topic might be better than a bunch of words. So I picked up my marker and I'm on my paper and nothing happened. And I'm trying to figure out, hmm, how would I draw this? And instead of trying to figure out how to draw today's lesson, do you know what I did? I said, I can't. And I put the marker down and I was about to try to figure something else out and then it was like, bam, my epiphany. I thought, Mr. Speed, you have been talking to kids every day at the beginning of class about being your best and doing your best and everything you do. And now here's an opportunity for you to actually put those words into practice and what did I do? I said, I can't. So I thought, I'm not gonna ask you to do something that I won't do for myself. So I tried to take I can't and shift it and move it to I can. So I'm gonna show you a little bit later what I can't looks like, and then I'm gonna show you what I can looks like and then we'll have a discussion and we'll continue to talk about that later in the lesson. But right now, thank you for um, allowing me to tell you a little bit about what my aha moment was, my epiphany was last night. So if you're ready, let's go ahead and do the pledge. And for those of you joining us today, I know you don't know the pledge, but if you keep coming to the class, you'll pick up on it and then you can join in with us. So let's do the pledge in one, two, three. I can be my best by doing my best in everything I do, by taking pride in who I am, 
My faith will see me through. I must have respect and confidence if I am to be a healthy body, a productive mind, and a wise human being. Okay, thank you for doing that with me. Let's go ahead and finish our lesson, and then we will move on to today's lesson. So yesterday we were still talking about how to determine whether or not a text that you're reading is actually fiction or nonfiction by picking up on some clues. You should have a list of clues, and if you don't, we'll review tomorrow. So if you don't know all the answers because you weren't in the classroom with us, that's okay. Just try to listen and pick up on as much as you can. So here is our text. Let me read it for you. Highland Mangab... Oh, and I don't know who realized that this word was spelled wrong and came in in the middle of the night and put that extra A in there. Thank you. I appreciate that, whoever you were. Okay, let's start over. Highland Mangabees are hard to spot. Scientists believe that fewer than 1,000 of the monkeys exist. They are shy and live in the forest canopy. The canopy is made up of the tops of the tallest trees. So we talked a little bit, if you remember, about canopy. And canopy has more than one meaning. And I think the author of this text realized that and said, you probably know canopy as the cover over a bed, but since this is nonfiction and the author wanted you to learn something, they gave you the definition with, they, I'm sorry, they gave you the correct meaning of this word because canopy has more than one meaning. So they didn't want you to think that the um, Highland Mangabees were hiding out in the tops of someone's bed, but instead the canopy, was, the canopy is made up of the tops of the tallest trees. So the monkeys were up in the tall trees. And can you kind of see how these two definitions go together? Top of the trees, top of the bed, same difference. Or very similar, I should say. Also, another clue in this text to determine whether or not this is fiction or nonfiction, I gave you a hint. Numbers, remember, if you're dealing with nonfiction, if you see something, um, or if you see a lot of facts and numbers in the text that you're reading, might be nonfiction. So I think we can all agree that this is a nonfiction text. So let's move on. Now, wow, here's another text. A lot of words. On the first two examples, if you remember with Kojo, the lying monkey, and now talking about the monkeys in this particular text, the nonfiction text, I gave you some help. We walked through it together. Now I want to see what you can do on your own. Here's a text. We're going to read it together first. Then I want you to read the green portion on your own. We'll read the pink portion together and then you'll read the blue portion on your own. That way you'll hear the text, you'll read the text more than once because another great way to improve your comprehension, to understand what you're reading, is to reread the text because every time you read it you'll pick up on something new. So let's read this together. It's bad enough to be the runt of the group, but to be told after 75 years that you're not even a member of the club? What an insult! Pluto was first discovered in 1930. Until 2006, students were taught it was the ninth and smallest planet in the solar system. Smaller than Earth's moon, it is not even as wide as the United States. Okay, so this text is about the planet Pluto. Now what I want you to do, we've gone through it together once. Now I want you to read the green on your own. And if you are watching today and there's someone watching with you, it's totally okay if they give you some help with some words that you might not be able to pronounce. So, follow my finger, and I want you guys to read it on your own. Ready? And begin. Oh, 
Okay, now let us read the second sentence together. Ready? And begin. Pluto was first discovered in 1930. Until 2006, students were taught it was the ninth and smallest planet in the solar system. Now go ahead and read the blue sentence on your own. Follow my finger. Ready? And go. Did you see how going over the same text more than once helps you get a better understanding? Did it make a bit more sense for you the second time we went through? I hope it did. Now, if you don't have it, now would be a great time for you to go get a paper and pencil because I'm going to ask you some questions and you are going to provide me with answers and you're going to prove that your answer is correct by telling me where in the text you found the answer. And you can write either sentence one, sentence two, sentence three, or sentence four as an answer, or you can write the actual words in the text that helped you support your answer that you give to me. So while you're getting paper and a pencil, I'm gonna go grab my thinking cap. Okay. Everybody back? Everybody ready? Awesome! What? What's so funny? Oh, this... You don't have a thinking cap like this? Well, mine works, so I don't know what yours looks like, but I'm sticking with this. Okay, get out your pencil. Here is question number one. Is this text fiction or nonfiction? And how do you know? I'm going to give you about 15 to 20 seconds to think about it and write down a short answer. Fiction or nonfiction, and how do you know? What are the clues that tell you this is a fiction or nonfiction piece? Mm -hmm. Wow. Okay. You have your answer already? What's your answer? Okay. Let me ask someone else. What did you come up with? Huh, okay. And how do you know? Oh, okay. For those of you in the back, if you didn't hear, one of my friends up front said that this is nonfiction. And one of the clues they found is that there were dates. Pluto was discovered in 1930, that's a date. In 2006, that's another date. 75 years, another date. So they remember that that might be a clue that you're reading nonfiction. High five if you got, I said high five and gave you the thumbs up. High five if you got that right. Excellent. Okay, let's keep going. True or false? True or false? Pluto and Earth's moons are the same size. Pluto and Earth's moon are the same size. True or false? have an answer? What's your answer? What'd you guess? Oh, okay. I heard sentence four, and you are right. This says in the text, and you're finding evidence, small, smaller than Earth's moons, it is not even as wide as the United States. So Pluto and Earth's moons, they're not the same size. Pluto is actually smaller than the Earth. Excellent, if you got that one. Let's try one more. When was Pluto first discovered? When was Pluto first discovered? Wow, you found that one really quickly because we talked about that one and that was pretty easy. Pluto was discovered, if you said sentence number two in 1930, excellent job of finding the evidence in the text and not just making it up. Let's see, last one, true or false? Pluto was kicked out of the club after being included for 57 years. True or false? That one was a tricky question. I wanted to see if you were paying attention. I tried to trip you up. So I switched the numbers. I transposed the numbers. Instead of 75, I said 57, but you were smarter than that. And you know that the evidence is in sentence number one. That 
is false. It wasn't 57 years. It was actually 75. Well done, guys. Well done. I could, was it, I give you a round of applause. <laughs> okay, let's move on. And let me show you what I, let me show you what I meant when I talked about moving from I can't to I can. And I'm going to take off my thinking cap now because I'm starting to get hot. It's hot being under all that fur. I don't know how wolves do it. That was, that was the, the wolf was, was howling because, ah, never mind. Okay. If you were here on this day in class, you probably saw this picture. And I might have even said, oh, I can't draw. That's why I only have stick figures. This was an example of me saying, I can't. And remember the cliff, the person, ah, he stood at the edge. Bonus points if you remember the nonfiction word for cliff, the synonym for cliff. You usually see fiction. If you're reading a fiction book, it'll say cliff. But a nonfiction book might call a cliff a, you remember? A precipice. Precipice and cliff, synonyms, they mean the same thing. So this was, my, this was me saying pretty much, I can't draw. This was me after my epiphany, after my aha moment, me, after me saying, Mr. Speed, you didn't even try. So how can you say you're doing your best if you haven't even tried? So I told you, I went to the Googles, I went to the interwebs, and I thought, I am going to do better. And I came up with this. I complete, I started over, and I thought, okay, this is really good. And in case you're wondering, on the I can't, those were probably boy stick figures, and I didn't want to just draw all boys because girls are just as smart as boys. And then I realized I really didn't know how to draw hair, so hmm, that's what happened. Okay. And I looked at this and I thought, this is really good. But something said, it's not my best. It's better than what I drew when I said I can't, but it's still not my best. So I started all over. Oh, actually, I'll leave that there. And I tried, and I tried, and I tried again. And this is the final version. This is what I came up with. After I stopped saying I can't, I was able to do this. So I have a question for you. How do you think I was able to move from I can't to I can? Number one, I had to start, I had to try. I had to try, but I'm thinking of another word. What moves you from I can't to I can? I'm thinking of a word, and you might already know it, but it starts with the letter E. I actually put in some, that's right, I actually put in some effort. So if you put in effort, you can also move from I can't to I can. Maybe you're saying, I can't read. I can't pronounce that word. I can't do math. I can't learn Spanish. I can't play basketball. I can't swim. If you put in effort, you see I went from I can't, a little bit effort, it got better. I put in even more effort and my drawing got even better. Now, are they going to hang this up in the St. Louis History Museum or the Art Museum? I doubt it. But I'm a lot prouder of this effort and this result than I am of what I produced when I said I can't. So I just want you to know that the next time we say the pledge, I can be my best by doing my best in everything I do, I really want you to think about when you are working on something, giving it your best. So with that being said, here's our new lesson. I want to see 
if you can figure out what is this? What does this mean? What am I, the artist and the illustrator and the author, thank you very much, what am I trying to say to you? What's my message? What am I trying to get you to understand? Because this is today's lesson. And we talk so much in class about how words can help you, um, how authors can use words to give you clues. Well, illustrations can also help you understand a text. So I'm going to give you about 30 seconds. What lesson do you think this is um, this is telling us today. Study it really, really closely. What do you think? Look at what's up at the top. Look at that symbol. What do you think the bottom represents? What's your best guess? I'll give you about 10 more seconds. Okay. After looking at the top third, after looking at the middle, after looking at all of this at the bottom, what's your best guess? What do you think our lesson is today? Wow. Good answers. Oh my God, you guys are awesome. Drawing conclusions. That is exactly what our next lesson is going to be talking about. Let me explain to you my thought process and see just how close my thought process is to your thought process. See if we came up with the same answer the same way. See the top portion We've been talking, this is my attempt at, at, at graphically representing clues that the author, the artist, uh, I'm sorry, the illustrator or the author will give clues. And if you are reading carefully and if you're paying attention to what you're reading and if you examine pictures, you'll find the clues that they're giving you to help you understand what you're reading. Everybody should know this symbol. This is the plus symbol. So that means taking the clues that the author gives you plus now all of this down here that's you it may not look like you but that's you and these are all the things that you already know you know numbers and you've been places you know your colors you now know nonfiction clues you know text evidence clues you know people you know dates you know emotions, because we all have emotions. Um, where's the other? Everybody knows their birth date. So this represents you and all the knowledge that you carry around with you every day, all day, that's right there in your head. So if you take the clues that the author or the illustrator give you in the books, and you add to that all the information that you already know, when you process all that information, you should be able to come up with a logical conclusion or you should be able to draw a conclusion about what's going to happen next in your book, who's going to say something next in your book, what someone else is going to do next in your book. It helps you make a, a best guess. So let's look at one quick example. Here's an example, drawing a conclusion. I want you to, while you're reading, think about everything that you already know with you that you've been carrying around in your brain for years. Erica held her father's hand as she crossed the busy parking lot. They walked into a grocery store. Erica's dad lifted her into the seat of the shopping cart. Here, said dad, you can hold the shopping list. Now, I want you to look and see if you can find what clues in this passage the author has given you that if you can find the clues will help you come to a best guess logical um, actually I'm sorry will help you make a best guess and figure out what's a conclusion you can draw from this passage can you say a that Erica's 
This is talking about Erica's first trip to the grocery store. Erica is very young. Or Erica's dad, that small word says dad if you can't read it. Erica's dad is very old. Hmm. Erica held her father's hand. Have you ever been out and gone somewhere and it's been busy and you hold someone's hand? You have? Of course you have. Hmm. So that's a clue. Also, you're experiencing, you're pulling files from your head saying, I've been that too. I know what's going on there. They walked into a grocery store. You've been in a grocery store. But here's what I think is the strongest clue. Erica's dad lifted her into the seat of the shopping cart. If you've been to a, a grocery store, you know that those seats are very, very teeny tiny. So if someone's going to fit in that cart, they've got to be very small. And most small people are really young. So a logical conclusion to draw from this text based upon the clues from the author and your background knowledge is that, did you say B? Erica is very young. Give yourself a round of applause if that's what you came up with. Excellent. You know what? I think now would be a good time for us to stop. And I think we should talk about this a little bit more tomorrow. So tomorrow at our lesson, we'll talk about drawing conclusions, but then we'll also talk about central message. So thank you so much for joining today. Keep inviting your friends. We'll keep making room and we'll keep learning together. Have a great day. Bye-bye.